All right, let's get started now. Everyone can please quiet down and take your seat. That would be wonderful. Thank you. We'll start off with a short film on their upcoming panel. Thank you, and happy Ocean Day to everyone. It's so exciting to have the ocean have a presence here at Davos. For those of you watching online, please send us your comments or questions to hashtag Ocean Davos so we can address them here in the audience. Uh, a lot of new faces in the room, so I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Daniela Fernandez. I am the founder and CEO of Sustainable Ocean Alliance and also a member of the Friends of Ocean Action. And it is a very exciting day today because we've covered a lot of topics from plastic pollution to shipping. And now we come to a very interesting topic, led by Jim Leap, a uh, fellow friend of Ocean Action and also a professor at the Stanford uh, Center for Ocean Solutions. And the topic is legal fishing. And I will leave you to take the conversation on because there's not that much time left. So please, Jim, take on the floor. Thank you. So if I can ask the panel to join me on the stage. Um, we have a fantastic panel uh, to talk about this topic today. Uh, Heather Coldaway on my left. Um, a fellow at National Geographic, also with ZSL, the Zoological Society of London, has become a, an articulate spokesman for the challenge, challenges facing the ocean, has done a lot of research across many of these challenges. Uh, Kumi Naidu, uh, with whom I have a very long history, Kumi several times dragged me to the barricades, I would say, when I was the head of WWF and he was the head of Greenpeace. Um, we used to go open the door, or kick the door open, and then he used to go in and do the negotiations. <laughs> yes, exactly. It was perfect. It was true. So, uh, so Kumi, a long history in conservation, but now the head of Amnesty International, so bringing in now quite an interesting lens to these problems. And then Sanjan, who has a long career in conservation science and as a, as a spokesperson for our cause, and now the chief executive of Conservation International. So, so it's, I want to get straight into conversation. Let me just say a little bit about what, why we're here. Um, so you saw in the movie, uh, in that brief film, some of the basic facts about illegal fishing. I mean, this is a scourge across the ocean. And it's 23, well, the, the estimates vary, but it could be as much as $23 billion a year. More importantly, illegal fishing in, in many parts of the world. Illegal fleets have simply wiped out fisheries that c local communities have depended upon for generations. So the, the impact can be quite profound. Uh, it, of course, steals resources from coastal nations. It also undermines their ability to manage their resources. And it cheats the fishermen who are trying to do things right, who are trying to play by the rules. So just as a matter of fishing, this is a big problem. It's a, man a matter of managing that resource. But as you saw indicated in the film, it, of course, has much broader implications, because illegality in fishing tends to come with illegality on many other fronts. And it's that broader dimension of, IU, of illegal fishing that we want to talk about today. And I guess I do one acronym check, which is for reasons that you know, surpass understanding. We call this illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, which is technically important, uh, but very confusing to anybody who's not inside the conversation. Um, so we will, in shorthand, call it illegal fishing today, if that's OK. Um, but, uh, but this panel will begin to help us explore sort of what are some of those dimensions, and, and how is it that we make the case for action here, what are the things we should be concerned about? And before we finish, I think, uh, I hope we will also get to. So what what's, are some of the things now underway that give us the opportunity to really, to really make a difference, to really turn the tide on the fishing? So I want to start with Heather um, and ask Heather just to give us a, a bit of a picture of, of 
how illegal fishing relates um, to a broader set of criminal activities and why that matters. Thank Heather. you, Jim. Yeah. Um, so this is a fascinating topic, and I think the, the title is quite necessarily emotive. Um, it's not my specialist topic at all, but I think if you work in conservation or marine science, it crosses your path in multiple different ways, and it's definitely not something you can ignore. But I certainly, prior to this, did um, tap friends who are researching this at the University of Exeter, and Tony Long, who's a global expert on this with Global Fishing Watch, and various other people to give me advice and thoughts about, uh, about this challenge from their perspective. But where I come from is seeing this as a really big global problem. And um, to be British about it, something I'm really quite cross about. <laughs> um, it makes me angry and sad in equal measure. I think it is something that we have to face up to and address. And actually, the world has committed to do so. Under SDG 14, under 14.4, we're going to get rid of illegal fishing by 2020. OK, so that's the year after, next, next year. OK, so when we talk about these figures, we talk about this billion dollars industry. We talk about the complexity, the criminal activity, um, and the global nature of this. Bear in mind that people in this room are going to be partly responsible for that, us achieving that objective by the end of next year. And it's undermining so many of our conservation activities. So from my point of view, I've, I've worked in the Philippines for over 20 years, um, and I see it at, at that frontline end of, of very poor communities um, who are resorting to methods like dynamite fishing, uh, resorting to depleted fisheries from uh, thanks to offshore fisheries and, and illegal activities such as very fine mesh trawling, uh, meaning that in some communities I've seen them just eating soft corals because that's all they have left to eat. At the same time, families I know have been part of illegal trafficking where uh, the, human, uh, the human element where people go on to those fishing boats and um, are never seen again. Um, on the other hand, I've been uh, very involved in um, supporting and trying to provide the science around very large marine protected areas, particularly the British Indian Ocean Territory, Chagos Archipelago. And there we see illegal fishing um, accessing these last ocean wilderness areas and depleting shark populations in particular. And the dynamics of that trade changing over time as it gets cleverer, more complex, and the countries involved are affected by things like um, fuel prices, where or not you can get to these areas and make it economic. It is a huge global um, issue, as Jim has already said, um, and it's rarely isolated or opportunistic. I think when we talk about things like piracy, you know, this first thing is, oh, you know, think about movies and, you know, there's slightly um, Machiavellian, but, you know, all, all rather nice. I mean, this is organised crime. It's economically driven and it's extremely serious. And I think there's three areas which I'm just going to give an overview that are relevant for ocean crime. Um, first is, you know, the, the direct fisheries crime itself. That's catching the wrong species in the wrong place, at the wrong size, at the wrong time, uh, using the wrong gear and in the wrong amounts. So these are all areas that you know, are either controlled or uncontrolled, uh, but are part of the conservation and management measures that we should have in place. So that's sort of the direct um, criminal elements of that. Um, and I think using the word crime is quite emotive, but the implications of what that's happening of the ocean of the planet and on communities is criminal and we mustn't underestimate that then there's the fishery the second area is fisheries related crime so that's um, things to do with the fisheries and that really is in in two categories one is um, sort of the paperwork side of things, we hear a lot about flags of non-compliance, so, so vessels that have opportunistically um, or for financial gain taken on flags of convenience, they're not following and, or complying with international law, nor are the countries that have sold those flags uh, following that. And then the people involved, uh, so people on those boats, um, often, uh, well, tens of thousands who are often enslaved on fishing vessels, leave, leave, living in um, horrific uh, conditions, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that um, more later. 
And that links to violence at sea. I mean, Ian Abina uh, did an incredible job with the New York Times exposing uh, the violence and the, um, at sea, the complexities of enforcing um, against um, uh, abuse uh, and even murder at sea and, and the challenges of doing that and the fact that it's, it's, um, it, it's very, very difficult to enforce and largely anonymous. And then finally... It's the crimes associated with fishing. So that's where fishing can be a very convenient cover for much wider crimes, drugs, people, arms, piracy. Um, and then with my conservation hat on, also what we're also seeing increasingly is wildlife crime. The, um, the example that always sticks in my mind in 2013 was when a Chinese fishing vessel um, hit Tubataha Reef uh, an ocean wilderness area fully protected in the Philippines, um, was filled with uh, 10,000 kilograms of pangolins, the scaly anteater, and the most highly trafficked and, and critically endangered mammal on the planet. And that, to me, summarised everything that's wrong. <laughs> a protected area <laughs> impacted. Um, and, and then with the, the Chinese um, fishermen on board, and I don't know, the, 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 you know their backgrounds or history, but that, the human side of that too. Great, no, Heather, thank you. And I think you've given us a good framework for starting from the fisheries center of this and its much broader implications. So, I w so Kumi, I wonder if you can take us into some of those, and in particular, how this becomes a human rights issue. OK, thank you, Jim. Uh, it's, not of, it's not often I had a chance in the 14 years I've been attending Davos to draw on a South African sort of wisdom where you followed a very comprehensive, eloquent speech, like what you just said. You started by saying, most of the really good points I wanted to make have been eloquently made by the previous speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and then you said, however, for emphasis, then you spoke for five hours. <laughs> uh, but, but I just want to endorse what you said. And I want to take us back to 2013, when Newsweek had a front page cover and said, because of rapacious greed, all that will be left in our oceans four decades from now will be algae and jellyfish. And when you, when you looked at the article, they said because of the triple whammy of uh, ocean acidification, which is more and more carbon, less and less forest to absorb it, that's going into our oceans, turning our ocean into acid, uh, overfishing, and the dumping of toxics, including uh, oil spills. Now, Newsweek is not a particularly lefty or environmentally friendly magazine. So you take them seriously in a way that maybe you wouldn't take uh, Sanjan as a, <laughs> that seriously. <laughs> <laughs> because you're a vested guy, man. <laughs> I haven't seen you in two years. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, those of us who are advocating, obviously, we have an interest. But why is this a important? Uh, I mean, it's quite a shocking statistic, right? And it's very shocking from an economic and social rights perspective, because one billion people in the world actually rely on fish as their source of protein, as a key source of protein. Okay? So I just thought what I would do is just give you two examples right, of um, where things have gone wrong and how we can fight back. Mm. So Senegal and the West African coast generally, uh, we had Japanese, European, um, Chinese and Russian uh, trailers coming and really just devastating. You know, people, fisher folk in Senegal, uh, for example, thought those fish had got extinct because yeah. what they would do is put big uh, nets, which basically when, when they fish, they don't just take the fish, they're taking sediment, they're taking small species of fish and so on. And we, uh, when I was at Greenpeace, we lobbied very hard to get the Senegalese government to institute a moratorium. And in six months of moratorium of no mass fishing, illegal fishing, species started returning. Six months. Mm -hmm. Species started returning. Uh, people started catching healthy uh, amounts of fish. So I say that is things are really bad. We, are, we have a very small window of opportunity to turn this thing around. But with political will, I think we can uh, get there. Then. How that's connected to European fisheries policy, for example, because Europe was dragging its feet for quite some time to get a good uh, European fisheries policy in place. And the Spanish government at that time was one of the governments that were holding us back. And so my colleagues in Spain managed to get a meeting with me and the Spanish um, 
fisheries minister. And I said, you know, what's the point of me going for that meeting? She knows exactly what I'm going to say to her. I almost know exactly how she's going to respond. I said, let's bank that meeting, but let's take three leaders of fisher folks, communities from Mauritania and, uh, and Senegal. And when we went into that meeting, I can tell you there was three languages, English, French, Spanish. It was a very complicated roundtable, whisper translation. But I can tell you, if we're going to win on the oceans, we need to give voice to and space for the people who are in the front line of their livelihoods being protected. Because I can tell you, with my PhD from Oxford and whatever, the eloquence didn't compare at all with the eloquence mm. of those three representatives who could talk with the tents. And one of the things they said, to make the connection with security and pirating, uh, one of the said, Madam, we are simple people. We don't want to do harm to anybody. We just want to fish, feed our families, and get some money to send our children to school. Mm. Please don't put us in the position that you put the Somali fishermen mm. into. Mm. We do not want to be pirates. But if you do what you did in East Africa and destroy the fishing stocks, then you will be giving us no option but to actually consider those kinds of activities. I tell you, I didn't know he was going to say that, but it was just like a chilling silence for like a minute. But in a sense, you know, when you look at some of those uh, issues that we face with pirating, the fact that we do not take care of our resources properly gets us into the issue. And what I would say is, jokingly saying, I would say that three of us, four of us here, and all the environmental organizations care more for the fishing industry's long-term future than the fishing industry cares for it in itself. Let me say why yeah, I say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Right. no, basically, yeah. when I, uh, the, there was this company, for example, called the second largest uh, retailer, Metro, right? Yeah. yeah. In uh, Dusseldorf, yeah. yeah. So I met the CEO here in my first year as Greenpeace in 2010. I invited him to bring his entire senior management team to Amsterdam for half a day. He responded, he brought his team. We had an open discussion, and in it, I said, I care more about the long-term future about your business than you do. And so how can you say that? And then his environmental sustainability person actually gave him the answer why. Because what we're saying is we don't want to kill the fishing industry. We want this industry to be going on forever. We want them to be more equitable and so on. But they are, you know, and sadly, that's the reality of a lot of the corporate reality that we face, is that people are so obsessed with short-term profit that, in fact, they are willing to not have a long-term perspective. Um, I would just quickly say, Mose, the, 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 you know, the question I was specifically asked to answer, answer is, how can law, <laughs> yeah, how can law rights, help? Especially human rights. Right, and, 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 and human rights, okay? But, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that part. No, no, I, I, I'm dealing with, I brought social and <laughs> economic remember, rights remember first. Amnesty International. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's where you're now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you see, this is the kind of siloed way we think, yeah, me too. But, uh, no, but seriously, the problem is not that in fact there's an absolute paucity of law. Right. The problem is the capability to police it. Yeah. So in Mozambique, for example, the Mozambican government wanted to go after illegal fisher folks, but they didn't have the resources. So you know, for a short period of time, for one month, the Greenpeace ship went there and they worked together. But they needed to police that. And, and I would say the same with forests, actually. The Amazon, there, are, there were lots of good laws, but to police that vast expanse. So there's something that needs to be done. And yeah, I think technology um, can be helpful. Like there's a possibility of, you know, using GPS technology and monitoring every part of the ocean uh, and the forests. If we do it, there's a conversation going on of how we can use technology in a way. I just concluded the reference to the Marine Stewardship Council uh, because I think and the difficulty we have is the certification that uh, people know what the Marine Stewardship yeah. Council, right? So the certification that they offer, and, and this was a challenge that we had, I don't know where they are now. Sometimes they just focus it solely on the question of uh, the Sorry, ecology. The ecology, yeah. But the example you gave about people who go on those ships, get enticed, never return, the slave conditions that somebody... So we were saying, as Greenpeace I was saying it, huh? human rights issue, we were saying you have to connect it to the issue of 
uh, human rights and so on. And I think right now, I'll conclude by saying that the agendas of our different movements are merging. And we don't have any choice now to do what the feminist movement asked us to, to do 50 years ago, uh, which was to deal with our issues with a greater intersectional approach. Intersectionality is what we need. Thank you. <laughs> Great, Kui. Uh, so I want to come back to some of the ideas you've already started to put on the table about how we solve this problem. But first, I need to give Sanjan a chance to strike back at you uh, and then to actually bring a different perspective to this. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And I just look around this audience, and it's, I'm almost ashamed to be up here because I, you know, I've seen Nishan and, and, and Brett and Matt and, uh, you know, folks who, who Kavita has been in the back there, you know, people who know a lot more about fisheries and conservation fisheries than I do. But let me offer a couple of perspectives. First of all, Kumi and I have known each other for a long time, so uh, that's why uh, I feel comfortable joking with him. Uh, but I, I must say, I think it was d sort of really inspiring to see this forum invite Kumi you know, in the role of Amnesty International to be part of this dialogue. I think that was really terrific. So I'm very, really, really quite happy to have you here because um, that human rights perspective and putting people first perspective is missing in, in a lot of that conversation, without a doubt. You made a brilliant point, actually, about whether we care more about the fishing industry lasting than some of the people who might be actually the money behind the fishing industry. I don't mean the actual fishermen who go out there and do that. And that's a really kind of, it makes you frame it a little differently. So let me offer a couple of things. Um, first of all, is this a problem? And I'm just looking at the question. Obviously, it is. And it's, it's, it's much bigger than I think even what we imagine. Basically, every fisheries we've looked at, we've found a f vast amount of unreported uh, of dark boats that are operating in that space. Not always illegal, sometimes it's just people trying to make a living. But a boat is a big investment, it's a capital investment. You buy that boat, it sits there, it's burning money every single day. And so the need to put that boat to work is very, very high. And some of it's just very transactional. Someone wants to ferry across to a place, they hire a fisherman. Uh, but if they also want to then be involved in drugs or involved in people smuggling, that also comes into play. And we have really no good way of sorting that out. I think this conversation about social um, indicators and factors uh, being built into how we certify fish as sustainable is a huge deal. I think the vast majority of consumers, when they go out there and in good conscience buy fish, actually think you know, you're getting something that's not just ecologically sustainable, but caught in the right way by the right people. And we clearly know that's not the case. And if you thought that the garment industry got a wake-up call a decade ago, this, you know, puts that to, I mean, this is far, far, far bigger crisis than, than that. And so I think there's a big wake-up coming, and I think the big companies sort of know this. I'll give you one example, which I think was a really good could a case study. So Costa Rica is a place we've been working in for a long time. And many of you know that one of the pride and joys of Costa Rica's marine systems is Cocos. Uh, Cocos Island, which has, you know, it's an incredible marine protected area. It's relatively well protected, great uh, deal of sharks there and all of that. But Costa Rica really doesn't have an effective way of patrolling it. The one boat they have can go out there and basically it has to turn around and come back. So last year, something quite remarkable happened. Costa Rica basically took delivery of two very big um, cutters from the US Navy. These are boats that the US wasn't uh, putting onto frontline action, and they were willing to uh, transfer them under certain conditions to the Costa Rican government. And those boats now can allow, allow you know, Costa Rica to not just patrol Cocos, but really enforce their regulations. It came with planes. It came with helicopter support. How did that happen? It happened partly because the ambassador to Costa Rica realized that a lot of the trafficking of, a lot of the illegal fish that they were catching on the high seas had some part of drug trafficking or people smuggling, uh, uh, migrants that were involved in it. And he basically mm -hmm. took Kay Granger, right? Uh, he took Congress people down there and he showed them a boatload of sharks in this case not shark fins, the whole sharks, stuffed with drugs, stuffed with drugs. And that 
changed the conversation. So no longer was the United States involved or interested in just helping them protect a marine protected area. Uh, they were now interested in trying to help them stop that. And it changed the equation dramatically in Costa Rica now that they have the ability to actually enforce it. So, um, so this is happening. Uh, we ought to take it quite seriously, and we have to figure out good mechanisms to make it happen. I'll, I'll say one last thing and, and uh, sort of stop there. The one thing I want to add is that you know, both um, our panelists uh, were correct in, in mentioning communities. So we did a very large study uh, two years ago where we looked at virtually every marine protected area on the planet, about a couple of hundred of them. And we asked a question, it was sort of a meta-analysis with all the challenges of doing that kind of analysis. We asked a question, you know, what makes some of them effective and the others struggle? And no surprise, it had a lot to do with how much money and how much management effort you're putting into it. But there was one emergent property that appeared out of it, which said that communities who were within sight of the resources that they cared about had a far better chance of protecting those resources. And this goes back to sort of, you know, Rare's sort of idea about turfs, the idea that communities are directly linked to a particular area and that that conversation is ongoing, that active management is happening, because I'll, at the end of the day, the people who know the illegal activities that are happening, there are the local communities and they're the ones who are going to get hurt the most. Great. Thank you, Sanjan. So, so across these first uh, comments about the nature of this problem and, and, and the many different dimensions of this problem, you've actually heard, I think, uh, several of the seeds of possible solutions. And I'd be very interested to hear from each of you, uh, as, as, especially as we put illegal fishing in this broader context. What opportunities does that open up for actually driving the kind of change that has to happen? And, and what avenues for change are to you most promising? for actually coming to grips with the challenge of illegal fishing and these di many dimensions to it. And I guess I'll go back in order, so because you haven't <laughs> talked for a while. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, there's clearly a lot of uh, plans in place and a lot of different organizations, um, it, it, you know, relatively recently um, published, you know, by Interpol, who are recognizing the organized crime nature of this and, and have, you know, sort of put a, a plan in place of, of what to do about it. Um, you know, we, we need to know the boats and we need to reduce this ability to for them to change identity and change flags and not be followed and, and you know, then what they do with either the fish or the people or the methods, um, that needs to be, to be dealt with. Um, I think at a presentation I was at of yours just earlier, Jim, <laughs> uh, where you show the role of, uh, you know, technology yeah. and yeah. how that's starting to change the space, supported by legislation through the Port State Measures Agreement, um, I mean, a, a question I have back to you is you, you said, I think 80 countries have mm -hmm. signed up. Yeah. How, what's it going to take based on, uh, you know, the, the short time frame we're talking about? I always forget we're in 2019 already, so it's year after next, <laughs> but it's next year. Um, you know, what's it going to take to get every country signed up? So I'm going to take the moderator's uh, prerogative of answering a question. But not yet. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> so I want to hear, yeah. I mean, sort of uh, Sanjan and Kumi, I mean, I'd be curious, what, what are you most excited about there? I mean, we, we don't need to cover the whole landscape, but we've touched on tech, we've touched on companies, you we've touched think? on consumers, we've touched on communities. I mean, what we touched on ministers, I mean, that is, you know, bringing this actually much more uh, viscerally, visibly to them. Um, what is most... Uh, he wants me to go first because he wants to think about this. Um, <laughs> I should so, go first if you want. So, <laughs> no, so, the, so you know, look, I'm, I'm, I am actually excited about real movement that we're seeing in the willingness of, of some of the big uh, buyers of particularly like tuna, for example, to really build in social measures and track that. that actually wasn't on the table a few years ago. It's really there now. Yeah. And, and I'm really excited about that because I think uh, it's really important. Um, I'll tell you what I'm not excited about, particularly, and I don't want to get in trouble because I'm sitting here in a, in a, in a home built on tech. Um, I think we jump to the tech solution for things very, very fast, right? So when we talk about wildlife crime terrestrially, every time someone says drones, I'm just like, you know, ready to sort of go, great, I get it. It's really useful to know it, but the challenge is also to find out and actually stop it, right? So that's a big leap. And, and I'm, I'm worried about the, the challenge that we have right now is the tech is getting us better and better in terms of figuring out who's doing what. But it isn't necessarily helping us actually stop it while it's happening. Mm -hmm. And for that, you actually need people. 
You need people on the ground, you need communities involved, you need real intel, and you need countries which have giant marine resources with at least some minimal ability to get there and stop it. You get Kiribati, I mean, you know this, um, Nishan, I mean, a huge island nation made a really good effort to put aside an area the size of California off limits to tuna fisheries. They got one boat. It basically can make one run and then it's got to come back and that's it. They cannot actually stop anyone effectively. So we, we have to think about how to fund uh, small island nations, but also small countries which have big ocean resources, and give them some ability to actually stop a crime when it's happening, um, as, o as opposed to just retro retract. Yes, yeah. Can I? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to say the same thing, yeah. I think. Just to press on that a bit. So I, I think what I hear you saying is, is tech is not a silver bullet. It won't yeah. solve this problem. You need but what I hear you saying is you need, the tech actually allows you to know that it's happening. Yeah, and But you then need the capacity to do something about it. Yes. Right? So it's, it tech enables, right? It can give you information you didn't have before, but it, that's only useful to the extent that you can act on The it. human element can yeah, still play yeah, a exactly. role. Exactly. Yeah. No, and, I, and I think techno optimists can sometimes just go straight to, yes, well, this will solve it. Um, it is potentially quite powerful, yeah. right, for things, that, problems that have defied us, but you need to not forget that. Yeah, is that yeah. And it depends what level of tech you're talking about. So yes. um, both in the Philippines and in Mozambique, uh, what has been transformational in re recent years is the level of mobile phone access mm. for even the poorest communities. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen communities self-organize around uh, the Operation Manit, which means crab, which means they would go and catch by anonymously um, texting to the police or the local government when they saw illegal activity in a way that they would never be comfortable say, saying their neighbor poached. They know they poached. They know they used the wrong methodology. But socially, it's really uncomfortable to say, I know you did that. And then it dis yeah, creates societal dysfunction. But if you have an anonymous mobile phone that allows them to text the authorities that something has been committed, that becomes different. Plus, make uh, you know there's a lot around behavior change and a lot around intolerance for um, activities which is more about community capacity building and, and social um, you know the so social dimensions of what is or isn't acceptable and we're seeing you know rare led some of that work there's a lot of great stuff happening about that as being when illegal activity becomes intolerable by communities and and that changes the enforcement dimension the, uh, the, just the, Jim, I, uh, I kind of hesitated a bit because you said, what makes you hopeful? And, 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 uh, and, and I, I, have to, I have to say, with all honesty and in my heart, uh, I remember you and I being at one thing and, and, and you sort of, we were reminding each other that the name of Martin Luther King's famous speech was, I have a dream, and it wasn't, I have a nightmare. <laughs> and it's very difficult to mobilize people and to engage people mm -hmm. If you tell the truth, and if the truth is such a dire truth, and, uh, and, and so right now I must say that I am still amazed that two months after the IPCC says we have 12 years to get emissions to peak and start coming down before we're on the track, on the route for irreversible catastrophic climate change, and it seems like all of us, yeah. with exceptions, we largely in a business as usual sort of approach. And, mm -hmm. and, and flew here. Eh? Flew here. Yeah, yeah. Well, whether we, okay, let's say we can justify that for a yeah. second. I'm yeah. not sure we can, but yes. let's just give that a pass. But then why is the conversation here? Yeah. Uh, not with greater agency. It would appear to me that business people now generally accept that climate change is an issue that needs to be de dealt with, but certainly nowhere near the urgency that we need them to be. But I would just say that the three things that I think can help. <laughs> One is consumer awareness. Mm -hmm. yeah. I really think that we have to make yeah. people more yeah. aware. And then secondly, related to that, is popular mobilization. So let me just give you an amnesty example quickly. I was in Raqqa, Syria recently to do document the devastation caused by ISIS and US-led coalition bombings. And after that, what we did was, we, I mean, as part of it, we, we mobilized about 5,000 young students mm -hmm. as digital decoders, right? So where they went on Google Maps, saw what, you know, we were trying to track all the buildings that the US had bombed. And so, so if you had, because see, even if you put drones there and nobody is monitoring in a, in a, in a conscious way, 
you, you're not good. So I, I, I'm not quite sure, but I think a technology solution without popular participation. Yeah, that's right. Is what we need. Right, you know? that's we need to get that, 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 that bridge. And the last thing I would say is, man, we need accountability. We need, because basically, people can do this illegal activity, right? Even governments, right? Quietly uh, endorsing certain trawlers and so on, because they're flying the flags of various governments. And they're okay with it because the sanctions that are associated with that act of illegality is so negligible, they can almost budget and pay for it. You know, in the budget, it's okay if we got caught five times this year, ah, no problem, it's not a big deal of our work. We need to ensure that, and that's where the legal fight is. We have to encourage our governments, and at the global level, uh, even the Friends of Ocean Action, I think, can play an important role here. I think we need to look at really heightening the sanctions associated with this illegality. That's what gets me really excited. <laughs> Great. Um, we, we got a late start, and we only have a few minutes left, but I want to make sure there's a chance for questions. So uh, anyone from the audience? Yes, Joe in the back. Yeah, just um, off post. Thank you. Come here, just one, in terms of that last comment, um, how well are NGOs coordinating on direct action. So Jennifer Morgan saying we need direct action. You say we need direct action. But again, you know, we're, we're seeing these powerful collaborations forming. At what point, given the emergency, do all the NGOs in this space just come together and say, we're all going to go after this one point in the system and just go after it, rather than spread yourselves as thinly as the oversight of the fishing? Uh, the correct answer to that would be as soon as possible, because that's what is needed. But um, I think with this moment where there's a lot of shock, you know, I mean, Trump and, you know, Brexit and, you know, a whole bunch of things that are happening that people are, sorry, uh, people are in a, trying to calibrate. So I think while we agree, uh, we need to move faster and Amnesty and the UNI Commission for Human Rights and Greenpeace and others, we are just about to announce a summit that we're going to call the Summit for Human Survival, where we bring together non-conventional actors on climate to try to bring some urgency to the debate. And part of it will be, uh, I hope, accelerating civil disobedience and non-violent direct action, uh, as well as following the money. Right now, I would say on oceans, on forests, on climate more broadly, I think the best accelerated change strategy that we got is not necessarily always thinking the best thing to do is campaign against the people that are actually running the fishing uh, trawler, but you go back and you look at where the financing for this is coming, because we don't have time anymore to go after endless numbers of companies doing bad things on the climate. But if we can follow the source of money and shut the flow of capital at source, stop banks lending to illegal things that potentially are illegal fishing, for example, I think that's the kind of strategy we should put energy to. I have a question back corner. Hi, I'm Femke Groothuis, uh, president of the XTEX project. We look at ways to align the fiscal systems with the goals of the SDGs and the uh, circular economy. So I look at it from a tax perspective, and I hear a lot of problems r around um, uh, the resources to actually implement uh, legislation. Um, domestic resource mobilization would be massively important for com countries to raise revenues, and our proposal would then be to raise revenues on pollution, carbon, the use of resources in general, um, and use those revenues to the benefit of the people, and also include these types of activities that have, can have a double role in terms of creating jobs and saving wildlife and, and, and nature. So um, I was hoping maybe you can uh, reflect on that, although tax, of course, is again another topic that uh, is often very hard to introduce in, in discussions because people don't really like to think about it, but it's so fundamental, so I just wanted to mention it. Yeah, that's great. Can I can I take three sure. questions, right, and then I'll ask you to respond to them and wrap because we have, sure. I think, three minutes. Is that right? Okay. So Brett, you are, oh sorry, Brett, and then well, okay, doesn't matter. I was being efficient. Hi, Brett Jenks from Rare. First of all, it's so great to see Amnesty International with Nat Geo and CI, well, and former and WWF, sorry, Jim, and Stanford, Stanford. to be talking uh, together about this important issue. We need to do a lot more of that because. 
the ocean is essentially a human right and, and protecting this planet obviously behooves all of us. So I, I'd love to explore at some point a way for us to do more together, these two communities. So here's the question. If, if we assume it's a right, and if you've, several of you have mentioned the role of coastal fishers, the role of uh, the, the impact on the fisheries and then the potential for coastal fishers to actually preserve the ocean and preserve the habitats that, that they benefit from, what if we work together to protect what we might call a kind of silver lining, 12, up to 12 nautical miles off the coast in many countries by legislation never used, is a, a sense of a, of a right, an indigenous right, a local right to keep out the industrials and to preserve the rights of locals to manage their own fisheries. So what if we were able to, to get a, a national governments to sort of preserve, protect, essentially empower, and give the exclusive right to local people to fish those waters as a human right. So just preference, hmm. um, NGOs and human rights groups together could potentially um, uh, make some ground there. Great, quickly from Nishan and then a last pass through. Um, uh, terrific panel, terrific po points. And so just to echo the question on accountability and some of the points that were raised b below. Over the last 10 years, we've talked at the G8 around um, offshore tax havens and clamping down. And the big gap that's been missing there has been vessel registration. As we know, Panama, but there's few countries that held that. And many small island states do not benefit from the revenues. So has there been thoughts about how do we engage the G7 and G8, a task force, in the way that with offshore tax havens, you have white lists, gray lists, and black lists. Why can't we do that for vessels and countries, and then you have accountability on where the major supermarket chains can actually purchase uh, seafood from. Great, great. So I'm going to go down the row. Sorry, you're first. <laughs> Three questions. Uh, the possible role of taxes, right? the possibility of a human right, basically a right to fish in the 12 mile zone. Um, and then this last question about uh, flags of convenience and how do we take uh, them on? You don't okay. have to answer all the questions, but Good. pick okay. up on one and last thoughts. offer your okay. last My thoughts. My last thoughts. Firstly, to the first point is it is a wider conversation and I think moving beyond the fish and the fisheries to uh, security, human rights, um, uh, illegal, other illegal activities is providing more opportunities to improve the system. Um, it will require thinking about the legislative framework because one of the problems at the moment is these mobile boats that are at sea for the long time are basically dodging every law um, in every place um, and so that is going to have to be fixed. Uh, definitely on um, moving ahead with solutions that are well demonstrated in many parts of the world and just need scaling up, which is what Brett's talking about. Um, but I do think um, we mustn't ignore the fact this is global and happens in the furthest, most remote. So having, uh, like Joe um, Royal here, visited Pitcairn, I think of that, you know, huge protected, you know, marine protected area population, local community there, less than 50 people. You know, so we, we have some... You know, that, and that's where I think the Global Fishing Watch solution is there. So there's a range of solutions we need to look at and need to be open-minded to them all. Um, and I think that's great, but I don't know anything about that. But if, um, <laughs> if Peter or others in this room could make that happen, it sounds brilliant to me. Okay, Kumi. Okay, I think that, uh, that is, in my judgment, should be eminently doable. I think the missing ingredient here is political will. I think we need to find ways to actually mobilize the kind of pressure on not just the G7, G8, I think we're talking about G20, the broader bloc, because there are more players and, and, and also it's not only developed country trawlers that are in play here, mm. right? There are lots of uh, bigger developing country mm. uh, trawlers also in play. Uh, I just on the tax question, yes, totally agree that it's a bigger question, but I would say it is a central question, mm. right? And I'll make a general comment about in conclusion, our response to all the news that we are hearing from science, from the deepening inequality, and from the 2008 financial crisis, and if you want to go back, the 1997 financial crisis, the response of the World Economic Forum in Davos should have been uh, recognizing that the economic system is not working for the majority of people on the planet, is not working for the planet not working for you know, gender equity, ecology, and so on. And the approach should have been, from 2009, 10 onwards, should have been, how do we invest in system redesign, system innovation, and system transformation? However, the approach here has been, 
system protection, system recovery, system maintenance. And I would say if anybody here is agree, uh, serious about addressing the unacceptable immoral levels of inequality in the world, the very simple thing we can do is use taxation. And by the way, if you go back and look at the United States and a whole range of countries and what the taxation levels were three, four decades ago, right? Yeah. Eh? Yeah, it, so, so I think, for example, I forget the name now, AOC, they call her. Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Cortez. So she's talking about a very high taxation rate. People are scoffing at it. But I think that that's the kind of commitment we have, uh, we need to have if we're going to actually secure this plan for future generations. Thanks, Kumi. Uh, very very quickly, absolutely. Yeah. Very simple. Uh, the price of fish is ridiculously low. It is impossible to imagine how I can buy a can of tuna for under a dollar. I, I just don't understand. It's the wolves of the sea, the last thundering herds of bison that I'm getting in a can for a buck, shipped all the way from a small nation, far, far away, via multiple channels. Someone is screwing these countries. <laughs> it's completely clear. And the sooner that these countries, like what Brett said, take ownership of it and really put a fair price on it, it'll never end up being managed sustainably. Great. On that note, thank you. Will I help? Thank, be, thank the thank panel. You. Thank you, Jim. Okay. So we'll take a 15-minute break, and we'll be right back with our next panel. Thank you.